The scripture this morning will be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. And that scripture is found in your pew Bible on page 1357, 1357. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, endured, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. You may be seated. What a great day and opportunity for us to be together. We welcome all of our guests. If you are here for the very first time, we hope that you will find the opportunity to worship together encouraging and inspiring, and that you will come back at other opportunities to worship again with us. We're thankful that you are here with us today. A couple of things I want you to be aware that after our worship today, uh, we are having a reception in the fellowship room to honor one of our members, Ruby Cyrus, as she is going to be turning on Friday this week 100 years old. Now that's a lot of living. And Ruby's life has been full, and so we want to take the time to be able to reflect on that and be able to, to honor her, and we're thankful uh, to have Ruby as a part of our congregation here at South Trail. I also know that tomorrow, Sarasota schools are going to be back in session. Some of the teachers have probably already been in the classrooms decorating and getting ready. Uh, and I know that the students from Manatee were in school last week. But I want us to take just a moment and pause and pray for this school year. And yes, I want to pray that the teachers still have hair at the end of the year. Okay? But I also want to pray for our children, grandchildren, as they go through this year, that their learning will be a positive experience in their life and that it will work uh, in concert with their faith in God. Would you bow with me and let's pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so mindful of the gifts that you give us, and one of those truly wonderful blessings are our children. And we pray, Father, for the young people here in this congregation, their parents, as they begin another school year. We pray, Father, that you will bless them in their endeavor, that they will recognize their, their learning is not just an academic exercise, but it has to do with life and living and, Father, their relationship with you. We pray that as they learn to read and know more about the world around them and think about life ahead of them, that, Father, in every aspect of their lives, that they will consider you, that they will seek to bring honor and glory to your name, 
that they will take the love that you have shown them with them and that that will be the expression of their lives to those around them. It's your love and their love for you. Father, we pray that they will be able to stand against temptation and compromise and that they will not be ashamed of their faith in who you are and the way you love us. Father, we pray for the teachers. We know that they have the very highest motivation. And Father, we pray that as they teach, that Christ will also be seen in them and that the children will be blessed because their teachers were Christians. Father, we ask that you would bless us now as we worship and as we study. In Jesus' name we pray. We're in 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to look at chapter 2. I heard a story about a high school student who was in a class that the teacher gave an assignment. The assignment was to have a conversation with a World War II veteran. Of course, the number of veterans has grown smaller, and so this was a challenge. But one of the boys in the class, he knew that his grandfather had been in World War II and was in the Philippines. So he approached his grandfather and started asking some questions about the conditions and the people and all these things. But this high school student, he was at that age where curiosity was just eating at him to ask one particular question. And he knew to go back into his grandfather's memory that this was a delicate question for him to ask. But he finally got up the courage and he said, Grandfather, he said, did you ever kill anyone? The grandfather thought for a second and looked at him. He said, probably I was the cook. <laughs> when you think about the Apostle Paul in Thessalonica, Paul was only there for a short time, just a few weeks, and yet the relationship was something that was so dear with these brethren. And it comes out in, in every part of this letter, in every chapter, in almost every verse. I want you to hear something from one historian about the first century and the time and even the place where Paul was speaking there in Macedonia in Greece. Think about this. There has probably never been such a variety of religious cults and philosophic systems as in Paul's day. Holy men of all creeds and countries, popular philosophers, magicians, astrologers, crackpots and cranks, the sincere and the spurious, the righteous and the rogue, jostled and clamored for the attention of the credulous and the skeptical. When I read that, I thought, you know, our world, our day, is very much like that. We've got so many different ideas competing, philosophies circulating. There are people of many different religious systems. The question becomes, how can I determine what I should believe? What do you believe? Why do you do what you do? What do you hope for? Is there something that you can say, well, I have some rock-solid evidence. I have something that is absolutely certain. I have the assurance that what I believe is not just another man-made idea. I want you to listen, because Paul speaks of his joy with the Thessalonians. And again, his relationship was not because it was a long-term relationship. It was something that had just started. But because of their relationship in Christ, there was something that was very special. And Paul talks about even this short-term relationship was bringing him some deep, satisfying joy. We need joy. We need to have in our lives that which gives us a confidence and that which gives us a hope, that which gives us a future. So think, it wasn't Paul's relationship with them because they were good clients, because they had made him some money, because he was popular, or because it was just bringing him pleasure. There was something truly spiritual about the relationship that Paul had with the church at Thessalonica. I believe what he says here in chapter 2 and verse 13 is that that relationship, that joy, started because God's word 
is within us. God's Word. The transforming power of what God has communicated. Looks in again what Chuck read for us in verse 13. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it as it is, not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. When we think about the Word of God, its transforming begins with how we hear it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We know that, but it doesn't happen with everybody, does it? Not everybody who hears the Word of God all of a sudden is a believer, and certainly not a follower of what Jesus says. Paul said all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Peter said, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 21. Jesus talked about that scripture which cannot be broken. John 10, 35. The word of God is absolutely certain. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The transformation begins with how you hear it. I want you to look at, at the two little sections that Jesus spoke of in a parable in Luke chapter 8. Look with me in Luke chapter 8 and verse 18. Jesus tells a parable about somebody who lights a lamp, and they don't hide it under a vessel or a, a bushel. They don't put it under the bed. He said they put it on a lampstand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. And listen to what Jesus says when he concludes here in Luke 8 and verse 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. When you look at that, when the light shines, it gives a benefit, a blessing. The light shines into the life. So we've got to be able to listen as it truly is the Word of God. When God speaks, when somebody who knows what they're talking about, when you hear an expert talk about something, you just all of a sudden pay a little bit more attention to what they're saying. When you know that somebody doesn't know what they're talking about, how long do you listen before all of a sudden you kind of shut it off, kind of ignore, start daydreaming, I see some, no, 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 not, not right now. Look at verse 15. At the end of the parable of the soils, listen to what Jesus said, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience. You see, how you hear means how you not only listen, but how you weigh it. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar is, is having a night of, of great feasting and debauchery. And all of a sudden, a hand appears, and there's a writing on the wall. And there in Daniel 5, oh, about verse 26, 27, the interpretation of the writing is, and one of the things that Belshazzar is told is, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. I think about this idea of the transforming power of God, changing us into the image of Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.18, from glory to glory, what we see is the fact that God has spoken. And when I weigh, when I evaluate, when I consider what God has said, I know that it's best for me. I know that it is something that I should listen and obey. I should trust and obey God because it's His Word. It's not just the word of, of man. And a man might be right, but a man might also be wrong. You know what people say? Don't believe everything you hear. You know what that's become in our day? There are some people who've taken that to a, a skeptical position. They say, don't believe anything you hear. That's too skeptical. We need to be able to weigh things. We need to be able to think critically and examine it. And when God speaks, it's true. And it bears out that veracity because it's true over the long haul. It's not just true at one point in time, 
Some people talk about the Bible as if it's now out of date and it's, it's old-fashioned and it's anachronistic and it no longer carries weight. If I understand the Bible as being the Word of God, it's timeless. Its quality of truth is of the same eternal quality of God Himself. It is the bread of life. When I listen to the Word of God, what I'm understanding is that it's not just a written Word. If I listen to it, I become the same as the living Word. You remember what John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the living Word, the bread of life come down from heaven. And Jesus, being God in the flesh, when you and I listen to the Word of God, and we take it deep within our hearts, and it translates into how we live, we become the living Word of God. And as far as we follow Him, and as far as we love Him above all else, and as far as we are able to love and obey Him, we become that translation of God's Word that people see on the street, that they see in their neighborhoods, that they see in the workplace. They see us as God's people. This transformation is what the Bible says when it says the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I don't know what you're thinking. As I'm speaking, maybe it's good. I don't know what you're thinking. But inside your heart, God's Word can fine-tune and can help you to see what your motives are, what your thoughts are, what your intentions are. People talk about, especially the younger generation, they want people to be real. They want people who are genuine, who are the, the real deal, the, the genuine article. As Christians, you can't get any more real than letting the Word of God perform the surgery in your mind and in your heart to cut out all the sinful desires, to cut out all the, the impure thoughts, all those untruths, those deceptions that Satan has tried to place before us. We need to let God's Word reside in our hearts. There was a Jewish rabbi who was asking his students what the best way to stay right with God was. And one of them said, well, it's a good eye. If you can truly be contented. Another said, well, it's to be a good companion. Another said, it's to be a good neighbor. Finally, one of the ones, the students came, Eliezer, and he said that what it is, it's having a good heart. And the rabbi said, you have spoken correctly. A good heart is the best of all, because if you have a good heart, you're going to have a good eye and be truly contented. If you have a good heart, you're going to be a good companion, and you're going to be a good neighbor. God's Word within us. Paul's joy was that the people there in Thessalonica had God's Word living and abiding within them. Secondly, the joy that Paul had was because it was God's people around us. Paul recognized that brothers and sisters in Christ need each other. If you get isolated from the people in the body, the church, you're not going to get stronger. It's going to pull on you. The current, the drag of the world is going to pull you in different directions. You're going to lose your focus, your passion. You're going to get weighted down with the desires and the concerns, the goals of the world. What Paul says there in verses 14 to 16 is he talks about the suffering. And he says, you know that as you became imitators, that is, you were followers. He said, you know that, that there was suffering. And your own countrymen. And this is probably what's the most difficult thing is you think about it and you say, the Thessalonians were experiencing the, the opposition, the obstacles in their faith and their growth was from their own people. It was other Macedonians who were, who were opposing them as following Jesus Christ. But Paul makes sure that they understand that the Jews had also experienced that. That in the day when God sent prophets 
there in Matthew 23, 37, they had killed the prophets. And yet still Jesus' heart was breaking and he said, I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. The fact that persecution comes from them. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 15, 18? He goes, if the world hates you, he said, remember, the world hated me before it hated you. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be opposition to truth, to, to justice, to righteousness. We've got to make sure that we're following that which is worthy to follow. That we're not following the least common denominator because it's easy. Jesus encouraged them in his day because, you see, Jesus came to the Jewish people because they were prepared. They had all the prophecies. They had the Old Testament. They should have been looking for Jesus. They should have recognized Jesus, but instead they rejected him, and they killed him. Oh, I'm not laying feet. I'm not laying the responsibility of killing Jesus at the feet of just those few Jewish people who actually were there and called out, crucify him to Pilate. I'm saying that you and I killed him because we were the ones in need. Jesus died out of his love for all of us, for all mankind, for all time going all the way back to Adam and Eve. From the first sin, the only way that there was ever going to be accomplished salvation and truly satisfying the justice of God was for Jesus Christ himself to come and die. The fact is that the process was very painful. And even in trying to please God, what Paul says here, look at verse 16, that they were forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. You see, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. And we should never be ashamed of it. But these that were persecuting were trying to stop people from hearing the good news. That hasn't stopped. There are people in the world today trying to silence Christians. One of the movements claimed out of tolerance in our society is political correctness and is trying to take religious people, God-fearing, Christ-following Bible-believing people, and to tell them, you have no place in the public square. You, you have no venue, you have no perspective that should be voiced or offered. Let me ask you a simple question. Can you stop being you? Can you stop being you? If you are a Christian, if that's who you are, if that's what defines you, your faith in God and your belief that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins, can you stop being you just because you're out in public? Do Christians make the world a better place or do they hurt the world? Somewhere I think kindness and consideration and patience and forgiveness actually make the world a better place. To love our neighbor as ourselves, that's a command. Silence with the gospel is inconsistent with loving those who need to be loved. The bond that we have, God's people around us, gives us the courage, the encouragement to do and to be what God has told us to be. A lonely Christian is very vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. We need one another. We need to be built up. We need to be encouraged. Thirdly, what Paul says is his joy... The transformation of his joy was that the God's glory ahead of us. Paul had something to look forward to, and you do too. He talks here about a crown. If you've been watching the Olympics, how many of these Olympians you've seen step up and receive a medal, gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal? And there's such a pride. I've seen so many of those Olympians, even with tears in their eyes, as they realized what they had worked to achieve. The term for crown in this passage and others that talk about what the Christian will receive is most often the victor's crown. It's the one that you receive because you finished the race. Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 9. You fought a good fight. You followed the rules. There's a crown. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. If we are faithful till death, he will give us a crown of life. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, it's a crown, a crown of glory. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 8, Paul said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give to me in that day, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. You, as a Christian, are competing 
in the sense that you're running the race of life. And if you are faithful, if you continue to love God and to love one another, you will receive that glory. And look what Paul says in verse 19. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? We're not going to heaven empty-handed. We're going by joining hands. We're going by inviting and bringing others as we teach the good news and tell, spread the gospel to everyone that will listen. The joy of being in heaven is to be able to look around and know the people that you encouraged, that you loved, that you helped. The people you shared this life with, the people you shared this hope with, and to have that hope realized is something that is above and beyond what we could ever imagine. There are people in this life who go through difficulties. A person who goes through cancer and the cancer has become arrested may say, I am thankful to God. That's praise. But what about the person whose cancer is not arrested? The person who is dying from cancer and calmly says, everything is all right. The Lord knows what he's doing and I am not alone. That person has the peace that passes understanding. There is something about our joy. And folks, it's God's word within us. It's God's people around us. It's God's glory ahead of us. There is something that should be, as Paul says, our glory and our joy today. What's your glory? What's your joy? What's your hope? Are you living with that transformed joy that it's not just the fact that you have a clear conscience and you feel good and you're living today you're in the moment. Or is there something above and beyond this life that tells you that life is worth the living because God is waiting. Jesus Christ is waiting for you to come home. Today, if you understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is the Savior of the world, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Have you done that? On the day of Pentecost, they were told, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What a blessing. You can have the forgiveness of your sins. You can enjoy the joy of God's Word having its effect in you, God's people being bonded to you, and God's glory waiting ahead for you. If you need to come, we encourage you. If you are a Christian, and you realize in your life there are things that have kept the joy out of your life, make that right today. Give God the glory by making your life right with Him. If we can encourage you, step down to the front. We're going to stand, we're going to sing this song. Won't you come right now?